All right. Welcome back to uh, In the Newsroom with our North Shore Salem news writers, uh, journalists, news journalists, Paul Layden and Dustin Luca. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, we're going to let youth be served first this time, Paul, because we always start with the old timers. Um, but um, needless to say, uh, the world's eyes, or at least the country's eyes, are on Salem right now. October is a very special month. And uh, Dustin, do you live in the city? Uh, no, I live outside of the city, fortunately enough. Um, but I can tell you that trying to get to the city gets to be a little tough this time of year. I was going to say that. <clears throat> I um, I had an issue, I think it was this week, I can't remember because the weeks are all blending, where I got from on Washington Street, which is the main street through downtown, I got from Canal on one end to, I think it's Norman, which is the next block. It took me 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just because that main intersection keeps getting clogged in every direction, and then all four directions seize up. So we had that a, was middle of the week. I mean, as we're talking right now, Salem just announced that all of its city lots and garages are full at 11 o'clock on a Thursday, which is when we're recording this. So, right, right. And um, that's amazing because I know that uh, the official opening of the stuff gets underway on Thursday evening with the parade. Is that how it goes? Yeah, so as we're recording this, that's tonight, and that starts at 6 o'clock at Shetland Park and then kind of weaves its way through downtown. And and this is kind of, people view the parade as kind of being the last real big kind of hurrah for the residents before the tourists all show up and make life miserable in Salem. Um, but there are two others. Um, Mayor's Night Out is on Friday night. It's the first Friday of the month after the parade. Um, and for that, a bunch of businesses will be doing trick-or-treating. There's going to be all these events and games. I think it's like 3 to 9 or something like that downtown. Uh, yeah, 3 to 9 p.m. And then Saturday, there's the Halloween pet parade brought by uh, Salem Main Streets where, you know, all the businesses start doing pet-related things. And there's stuff about the rescues and the shelters. And there's a costume contest. There's an actual pet parade. So that's from 1 to 4. And then after that, it's all for the tourists. And the message becomes, do not bring your car to Salem. Take the train. Take the ferry. You know, take an Uber if you can to basically get to the outskirts. Don't even try getting into the perimeter of downtown because, as you can see, you know, middle of the business week at 11 a.m., the place is already full. That's insane. To I'm with. guessing that um, this also involves traffic from Peabody into Salem, from uh, Beverly into Salem. It probably affects the, both cities and towns, maybe even coming in from Lynn. Yeah, so it, it does affect Peabody actually very massively. Uh, and I know historically when we hit the Columbus Day weekend and then the final two weekends of the month, you tend to see a traffic backup starting on North Street, which is right outside of downtown in Salem, going all the way into Peabody, stretching all the way to and then onto Route 128. So we're talking about a traffic backup that's literally three or four miles that starts on the highway. And that's something that Peabody has to deal with. Beverly has a similar crunch when you're talking about 1A kind of going along Cabot Street or Rantoul Street in. And then I know Lynn has a little bit of trouble Um less so on that side and Salem's got some uh, shuttles that they're popping up uh, using the high school and the hospital to try to make it so cars that are on the south side of the city coming from Lynn don't actually come all the way into the city they stop right there but they're still having to deal with how do you get cars from Beverly and the Peabody side and there really isn't many opportunities because downtown is right on the edge of the city right there you know it was either last year or the year before there were actually like gates and, and perimeters put up around Salem because of COVID um, and that affected, uh, I'm sure, the attendance. And you've written stories about how um, maybe because those barriers are down, that this is going to be a, a record uh, year for tourists coming into the town. Well, and what's interesting is they were they also said the same thing about last year. And then last year it turned out to be a record year. Um, and usually when they're saying things like that, the way they're measuring it is when they hit like the last weekend of September and it's about as busy as last weekend in October, that's when they're like, okay, things are kind of going to be really big this year. And they're already finding that to be the case this year where the crowds are just bigger than anybody's experienced even before the pandemic in 2019. Airbnb was saying that, I mean, back in June, Airbnb was saying that rentals were up 50% over last year alone. So this year, there hasn't been any conversations about COVID protections. You don't have any kind of one-way paths down the pedestrian mall like they had in 2020 and then a little bit last year as well. There, there's still businesses that are kind of, you know, enforcing masks where they need to and where employees need to feel comfortable, you know, to work with people that are coming from around the world. Um, but the COVID protections and the measures and things like that aren't really there this year as they were last year because I think that a lot of people are just a lot more relaxed and kind of going with the flow. Right. And um, in, in terms of... Uh transportation 
Um, does Salem have a website uh, where people can go to see the best way to get in into town? Yeah, I think it's parksalem.com. I'm checking right now. <clears throat> yes, parksalem.com. Thank you for Thank the you. reminder. Perfect. All right. All right. Well, I'm, I may have some more questions for you on Haunted Happens because it's, uh, it, it's it, I can't believe how big it is. And I know it's it's a rare year round endeavor endeavor for those people who are involved with it. But uh, and this year it's the 40th. So, OK. All right. So there'll be some special things going on. Um, and I know that um, Kate Fox over at uh, Destination Salem is uh, involved with that a lot. Not Destination. What's it called? Yeah. Destination Salem. Yeah. OK. All right, let's go to Paul. Uh, Paul is way over in Beverly now, and uh, you don't have to worry about trying to get through Salem unless you're covering a football game like we did one night on Halloween night. Hold on one second. <clears throat> Call from Sam Unknown. Take care of that. Sorry about that. Right. <laughs> Beauty of, uh, of recording live, right? Oh, my goodness gracious. Anyway, Paul, um, lots going on in Salem, as always. But one of the stories that I, I, I really um, appreciate your covering all the time uh, is the, um, the continuing um, evolution of the Freddy's family's involvement with ALS. Because, you know, um, well, you can you recap that a little bit for us. Uh, such an amazing story going back several years. Yeah, no, that's true, Rick. Uh, thank you. So the story is that uh, last week, the... Food and Drug Administration approved a drug for the treatment of ALS. And of course, the local uh, tie is to Pete Frades, the late Pete Frades, and the Ice Bucket Challenge, which raised uh, about $120 million uh, for the ALS Foundation that goes into research into finding a cure for ALS. So I spoke with Nancy Frades, Pete's mom, and uh, she talked about what that meant, the approval of this drug. It's only the third drug that the FDA has approved to um, treat ALS. And so what this drug does, it, it delays the, on, it can extend, uh, you know, according to the studies, it could possibly extend the life of, uh, you know, ALS patients up to uh, 10 years. You know, there are lots of variables and, uh, but anyway, and as, you know, Nancy Frades said, it gives, uh, it gives people hope, you know, which is what families uh, of people with ALS and of course, you know, the patients themselves are looking for. And it was a nice story because Nancy said, uh, she's on the board of directors at Endicott College, which, you know, in the last couple of years named one of their new dormitories after Pete and the college holds and still holds an ice bucket challenge every year. So last year it was uh, less, Thursday, they held their annual ice bucket challenge and, and uh, Nancy and John Frady's Pete's parents went as they always do. And Nancy said when they got back in the car, she had been checking her phone, anticipating this possible approval. And she got the message that the FDA had approved uh, the drug. So it was kind of nice that right after they had left an ice bucket challenge, you know, which is why this drug was able to be developed because of the millions of dollars that were dedicated to that. Nancy said that ALS has been, you know, uh, research into ALS has always been underfunded and that has changed because of the ice bucket challenge and, and Pete Frady's. Yeah, that, that's amazing. It's such a great local story and uh, to refresh people's memories as well. Uh, wasn't John, he was a, a Beverly city councilor as well for a long time. Yes, yes, John was, yep. And, uh, now, I think next week or in two weeks, the annual, uh, you know, Pete Frady's Road Race is coming up, which raises money, too. That's always a nice event. And there's actually another, uh, you know, Beverly connection to all this because a lot of this, uh, you know, research has been doing, has, um, is getting done at the Sean Healy ALS Center at Massachusetts General Hospital. Sean Healy died a few years ago of ALS. He's a former, he, he was married um, to, you know, Kerry Healy, the former Lieutenant Governor that might, you know, people might be familiar with that. So Nancy said that that's where a lot of this work is going uh, toward, uh, you know, where a lot of this research work is being done. So that's another local connection to this fight against ALS. Excellent. All right, let's go back over to Salem now. Uh, what's next on your agenda, Dustin? 
Um, so I know that there's been a lot of things going on with offshore wind. Um, and there's just been, so there was some news with this one over the last couple of days that happened technically speaking on Monday. And then the news came out on Wednesday, um, that the owners of the empty land around the footprint power station, which was still footprint basically, uh, sold and closed on the sale of the property to a, uh, public private partnership, um, that will now build an offshore wind marshalling yard. So basically um, we are kind of starting to see this thing for the first time now. And now that the property has officially been sold and has been given from footprint to the city and its partners in this project, now they're gonna start going through the permits and the design and everything like that. They're hoping to start construction next year and they're hoping to have the thing open sometime in 2025. So we're talking like a two or three year cycle on this thing. Um, but what's really interesting about all this, because you know them closing on the property and selling it's kind of a procedural step in the process. Um, there's also a lot of conversations going on in the back end with schools and things like that about boosting career technical education in the fields that are going to be building these turbines basically at the site. So they're starting to think about conversations with like Mass Maritimes, Helm State. I mean, those are two of the names that I heard yesterday with one of the conversations that I had. Um, I know that, you know, community colleges in the area, other state colleges are looking to boost their programs to basically train the workforce that in three years will be called upon to start building these things. And to basically transform Salem Harbor into an industrial port, which hasn't really been the case for a couple of years now, ever since really they took out the opportunity for coal to be delivered. So. And so where would the turbines be built? I, I'm not familiar with that. So if you know, do, do you know the footprint power plant site itself? Like, you know, the, the massive building. Yes, 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 yes. So oh, if, I, I might have my numbers off, but I think there's like 25 acres on one side and then like 15 acres on another side that are just empty. And what they would be doing is they would be using all of that empty space to build wind turbines that would then be basically shipped out over the ocean to wherever they're going to be going, which in the case of the first contract to be built will be in Martha's Vineyard. Um, there's going to be a bunch of things. I think it's like 100 miles off the coast of Martha's Vineyard, which is where they're going to go. I so see. for five years, they're going to be building these things okay. either to full height or to partial height, which would then be put onto the ships, onto the platforms that they'll be put on, and then basically rowboated out to wherever they need to go. Okay, I didn't understand that. So it's not going to be a wind farm for Salem. It's going to be a place where they build turbines for other wind farms. Exactly. Yeah. And okay. we still don't yet know what exactly that looks like. Like the rendering that dropped kind of shows um, them standing the the stands for the wind farms, the, for the wind turbines up a little bit. Okay. And you can see that at least by the rendering, they're like twice as tall as all the residential homes around it. But if you were to compare that to actually putting the blades on top of that and everything else, then you're talking like five times the height of that. Yeah. And we don't know yet which of the two are going to be happening in Salem, but the rendering was showing the shorter of the two. Well, I wish one of you guys were uh, on the case in Gloucester because, uh, as you know, that blade fell off more than two months ago, and there has been nothing. There has been no anything, no report about how, why, what, when, whatever. Um, and I went up there uh, recently to, um, to pick up my son, and uh, we thought that there was a big circumference around the bottom of, these, of the towers themselves, uh, and there isn't. Uh, there's nothing keeping you from walking right up to the base of the tower and touching it. So um, I'm concerned about um, where these things are going to go. And, you know, I'm, I'm as green as anybody, but man, this is weird. But that's that's topic for another day. Well, thank you for updating that because I, I was totally uh, out, of, out of left field on that one. Um, thank you, sir. Paul, what's up in Beverly now? We got, um, we got Rantoul Street with more buildings. You've got grant money coming in. What's going on? Yeah, there's a proposal for, it seems like I say this almost every uh, week, or write about it every week, there's a proposal for another apartment building on Rantoul Street, um, and it will be a five-story apartment building with retail on the first floor, just, you know, the pattern of the other uh, buildings. It would be located near the train station, the Beverly Depot, which has, you know, also been going on for uh, years, so, uh, and this comes at a time where I think we talked about last week where one of the city councils in Beverly is proposing to limit the height of buildings to three stories. Uh, there's a public meeting on that topic scheduled for next week. So that'll be interesting to see where that goes. I know some people have said they think because that's been introduced, that possibility that 
know, developers and property owners might actually uh, rush to get their proposals in before any change is made. So maybe it'll actually speed up the development of taller buildings. So uh, so anyway, that it, it's just noteworthy that there's going to be a uh, you know, another building. Again, it's, it's the same issue. People say we need more housing, which we do. Uh, people say it's too much development, that the city is changing, that the apartments are too expensive anyway. They're not meeting the needs for lots of people. So it's, it's, it's the same debate that's, uh, that's continuing to go on in the city. Yeah, that's something I also don't understand. And, uh, you know, I taught math for so many years and I don't understand money because they talk about affordable housing in the same breath as as uh, low income housing, and they don't necessarily equate at all, um, according to different formulas. Right. No, that's a good point. I know, and uh, I've done stories on a new development that opened uh, up on Trozier Road in Beverly, up over the high school behind where the solar field is. It just opened a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you know, Harbor Lake Community Partners opened that, and in talking to them, and I'm you know, you tour through there and it's a, and they say, this is designed, you've heard this before, you know, workforce housing for, you know, they always mention teachers, police, firefighters. I want to say local newspaper reporters too. <laughs> yep. People who don't necessarily make a lot of money. And what they've said to me is that this, you know, the whole image of affordable housing and the terminology, is, you know, is difficult, you know, low income housing, affordable housing, workforce housing, what does it all mean? But generally, uh, you know, Harbor Light is saying, and they're doing a lot of building, including in Gloucester, and trying to you know create more more affordable housing. They say that the image of affordable housing is changing and needs to change because people think, well, this new place went up, and that's where all the poor people go. Like when we were younger, Rick, and all these uh, you know affordable housing towers went up in cities across the country, and you think, you know, but now they say, no, this is you know housing for people with. Jobs, you know, they say the people who wait on you in the restaurants, you know, we all say there's a shortage of workers in all these service industries. Well, there's just no place for them to live. So when we say affordable housing, workforce housing, I guess it's not sort of the old school, the real, uh, you know, real low income people. Although obviously there is need for those. And a lot of these places, these cities have you know, requirements to reduce the rent by as much as what, 30 to 50%, depending on your income, you know? so. They still uh, serve to some degree. People say it's way too uh, small. Uh, you know, they serve the really low income population, but it's supposed to also be uh, for people who have jobs, you know, in your community too. So, so it's a mix. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, back to Salem. Um, I'm still interested in what's going on with the potential in the Salem mayor's office. And maybe you could give me a little uh, update or, or uh, little reminder on that, Dustin? Yeah, so there is um, some new potential that has formed, even though there really is zero potential yet, because, and, and this is kind of one of the weird things about this entire situation is that there is not currently a need to replace Salem's mayor, but everybody is expecting a need to replace Salem's mayor, even though, if you really think about the last three governor's elections that did not have an incumbent in them, two of them were won by Republicans. So I feel like a lot of people are like assuming Kim's going to win this and saying, okay, what's going to happen after Kim wins when she still needs to win. So that being said, um, if she were to win, there would be a need for a mayor in Salem and a person has emerged. Um, interestingly enough, the uh, chief of staff to Kim Driscoll right now, Dominic Pangalo has, um, publicly confirmed that he is entertaining the possibility of running uh, a number of his supporters have come out and you know basically launched fundraising efforts because as a city employee he can't really do that so and i haven't had an opportunity to kind of look at how um like fundraising laws and things like that would be different for him because he's a city employee currently but apparently there's a difference there that i need to look into so i apologize for being ignorant of that now fortunately we have a month to figure this out but um yeah, so he's the only one that has emerged so far, and a lot of people were actually chatting about him for literally the last like three or four months, but, you know, things were really quiet, and then uh, suddenly last week, a uh, email dropped from, you know, supporters of his, and then when I reached out to him, he sent me a statement, so you know, he's, he's confirming that he's considering the run if Kim's wins, and then, you know, so for the time being, we just have to wait and see what happens on November 8th. I love the way you laid that out. Thank you, man. That's perfect. Okay. All right. Um, we'll see what happens, um, which leads us back over to Beverly. And uh, tell me a little bit about uh, 
the Beverly situation in terms of the mayor's office, because in Salem, it's a four year uh, commitment, I believe, um, a four year term. Uh, in many other cities, it's not. Yes, in Beverly, it's it's a two year term, but that could change. So uh, the city council uh, voted last week to send this issue to the voters. So what happens is every every 10 years, the city council appoints a commission to review the city charter, which is basically lays out how the city runs. And one of the rev one of the recommendations from the committee was to change the mayoral term from two to four years. Uh, that has to go before the voters. So uh, it will be on the ballot sometime next year in Beverly, whether it's a special election or during the regular election in, uh, you know, next November. So, you know, the issues, um, you know, the issues on this is uh, the proponents say that running every two years means you basically, uh, you know, never stop campaigning or you can't, you know, you, you serve an office for a year, then you have to start your, uh, you know, campaign for, for re-election and that a four year term would give not only the mayor more stability, but it might attract people uh, to work for the city under the mayor, how the mayor appoints the finance director, the planning director, you know, public works director, all these important jobs. And if people know they're gonna be in the job at least four years, maybe it would attract, uh, you know, more candidates, which is, you know, one. And of course the other argument is that, you know, you deprive the voters of a, choice every two years. And Beverly people pointed to, remember the, you know, former Mayor Scanlon who served for 20 years in Beverly, but, you know, in the middle of that 20 years, he actually lost a re-election uh, bid uh, to, to Tom Crean, who served as mayor for two years. But, uh, you know, two years later, people, uh, you know, most of the voters, I think, thought they made a mistake and they put Scanlon back in office. Now, if that happened, you know, voters would need to wait uh, for four years. So, uh, but that's gonna be up to the voters. Would that affect uh, city council terms as well? No, it's just it's just for the mayor. Interesting. Yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah. The other ones would still remain two years, which is interesting. So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. What All right, gentlemen. Um, last call. Um, anything you want to promote? Hype? Talk about what's coming up? Or yeah. How about Schubert? Can you ever have enough Schubert talk? <laughs> no, that follow up when he. Found out he got. I think he was he was in trouble somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do is is say Schubert and all our other stories like fade uh, from the interest of the public. I know I'm trying not to be too cynical about it because I think it is a nice story and it's good that people are that interested. But anyway, quickly, the news is uh, on Wednesday, Noah released a statement in response to a lot of social media rumors that Schubert is back in Beverly and back in the Schubert, you know, that he they, they've tagged. Schubert is a seal that was in the this pond in Beverly for a couple of weeks. You know, generate a lot of interest, was eventually taken to the Mystic Aquarium in Connecticut and was tagged and released back into the ocean in Rhode Island. So they can follow his, you know, whereabouts. You know, from what I understand, they can't pinpoint exactly, but can kind of track him over the course of several days. But he is, according to Noah, back on the North Shore, uh, not at like your local, you know, Dunkin' Donuts or anything, but in the ocean somewhere off the North Shore, you know. But so not in Beverly, not in the shoe pond. People are either, uh, you know, making it up or having fun with it, saying he's back on the pond. Did he actually go, the Did he actually go to the police station that night? Oh yeah, this video, Rick. Have, have you not seen? Have you have you seen the video? No, no, no. It's literally Schubert dragging himself along the sidewalk and coming to the police station at uh, two thirty in the morning. The pond, you know, the pond's probably. I don't know, a quarter of a mile across, a, you know, an office park parking lot. <laughs> I see a summer yeah. blockbuster here somewhere. Yeah, no, well, it's so funny because the Cabot Theater in Beverly, they, they actually last week, they uh, they ran a movie of a seal, which you guys will know the name of, and which I don't know, a famous movie about a seal. I can't remember the name of it. And they, uh, <laughs> sorry, but, and my daughter actually went and they sold uh, Schubert t-shirts, Schubert sugar cookies, Schubert stuffed animals. There you go. And they showed a movie about seals. So there you go. I don't know how newspaper advertising works in, in circulation, but I know that when I was at WESX in Salem, the biggest response we got on a call-in show all the time was when Al Nita would bring up the, the, uh, the issue of pooper scoopers for walking your dog. We got <laughs> the most response from that from it, just the phones just yeah. lit up. 
you could talk about politics or or war or or you know anything else, any other subject, nothing. But w- when that subject came up, boy, it just she just you never know what's going to draw our interest, I guess. Yeah. Well, no, someone has really- had Chicken Gate, Pickle Gate, Cobble Gate for the cobblestone issue that they had on River Street that one time. There you go. You know, they exactly. have them every couple of years. Exactly. All right, Dustin, what's on your mind to wrap things up here? Um, if you're thinking about coming to the city of Salem during October, because it is a lovely place to be, either think about doing it in November or either way, don't bring your car, bring a broom. Okay, great. I like that. So, <laughs> so there's going to be a parking lot for the broom somewhere, I presume, or parking. Yeah, it's called carrying it. It weighs a pound. <laughs> All right.